...of the Emperor and the party. I must therefore ask you again. I demand that you answer sincerely, frankly, and unambiguously, yes or no. Will you or will you not retract your books and the errors contained in them? Since your serene majesty and your lordships demand a simple answer, you shall have it without horns and without teeth. I must warn you before you reply that this is no longer a matter between yourself and your conscience. I will put it to you as bluntly as I can. You refuse to understand that common men want common things. It's not your theology they want, it's the earthly property of Mother Church. Not the sacraments, dear Martin, the silverware. That they mean to take by force of arms, leaving in your startled hands, like so many empty sacks, the spiritual virtues with which you so foolishly endow them. I am appalled by this evil and cynical view. The simple need of people is to find God without paying Rome for the privilege. I beg of you, if you cannot see reality, let the accumulated wisdom of the church see it for you. We are at the brink of violence and pillage and anarchy. You can stop that by retracting your heresies and depriving this mob of its leader. I believe in the goodness of ordinary men, and I do not fear them. And unless I am shown by the testimony of the scriptures, for I don't believe in popes or councils, unless I am refuted by scriptures and my conscience is captured by God's own word, I cannot and will not recant, since to act against one's conscience is neither safe nor honest. Here I stand. God help me. I can do no more. Amen. Martin Luther's confrontation from the film uh, Martin Luther with the Emperor. Today, all of you know, I am sure, of what may be called tension, discord, conflict in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. We are to have four very distinguished representatives of the Lutheran Church present this morning to discuss this conflict from opposing points of view. The Reverend Samuel J. Roth is pastor of Zion Lutheran Church. He's president of the Evangelical Lutherans in Mission, and he was a former member of the Board of Doctrinal Review of the Senate. Pastor Roth, what is it, theology or politics? Well, Parker, I think it's both. We certainly have theological differences. We see things differently in some cases in our understanding of the scriptures. But the biggest difference that we have is in the way that we deal with those disagreements. There is one way that says all disagreements are not to be tolerated and you must force out those who disagree with your viewpoint. I think there's a better way. Reverend Thomas A. Baker, a young pastor in the Lutheran Church who soon will be in University City at St. James. How do you see it? Well, I would agree with uh, Pastor Roth that the problem is theological as well as political. I would emphasize, I think, the theological a little more. I don't really see I suppose the synodical position as trying to get rid of anyone in an unevangelical way. I instead think that evangelical means are being used to help those who seem not to agree with the synodical position to realize their errors and to bring them once again into the synodical fold in the sense of preaching and teaching what we as a synod, especially for the past 125 years, have always taught. Mr. Gerald A. Miller is a fourth-year student. He wants to finish his education and to be ordained as a Lutheran minister. How do you see it, Mr. Miller? Mr. Parker, I think there are some honest differences in our church body in the area of missions and ministry, in the areas of theology and education. And uh, unfortunately, there are some people who feel that uh, they have the right to get rid of those people who disagree with them. And the way you get rid of people in the church 
is to convince them of false doctrine. I'm sorry to say that uh, they are getting rid of some of these people, I feel, without fairly dealing with the issues. Herman J. Otten is pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in New Haven, Missouri. And how do you see it, Reverend Otten? Well, basically all of Christendom today is facing a tremendous crisis. I think it's perhaps the greatest crisis that the church has ever confronted. It's not a matter of this or that particular doctrine which is involved, but all doctrine. And the very nature of truth is involved. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod today is attempting to deal honestly with this situation. It indeed may be true that the conflict in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod today uh, reflects a great struggle going on throughout the Christian world, perhaps throughout the entire world of mankind. So we invite you to hear the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod conflict discussion theology or politics during the next some 90 minutes. fortress is our God. We're discussing conflict in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, theology or politics. Pastor Otten, you made a remark in our beginning about the issue being, in a sense, much larger than the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, being a world issue. Right. Actually, what's involved here today in our church is part of this worldwide conflict. Um, throughout history, of course, the church has had to confront various doctrinal crises. In the early centuries, the crisis with regard to the deity of Christ, the 16th century, with regard to the doctrine of justification, where the church, the Orthodox Church, affirmed the truth that a man is saved not really by what he does, but by his faith and the merits of Jesus Christ, what Christ has done for him, suffered and died for his sins. Today, however, it's not a matter of this or that truth, such as justification of the deity of Christ, but the very idea of whether truth can be expressed in absolute terms. Now, today within Christendom, we have those who contend that it can't really be done this way. Uh, even in our own church, unfortunately, we have men who make that statement. For instance, here, I have a book which is edited by one of the members of our faculty majority here at the seminary, and by one of the professors now, a Lutheran professor, supporting our men, and here's what he says with regard to truth. Since human language is always relative, being conditioned by its historical development and usage, there can be no absolute expression of the truth, even in the language of theology. Now, Missouri in Perspective, which happens to be the publication of Elam, our uh, liberal group in our church, they similarly have made some similar statements with regard to truth. For instance, they tell us, for truth is too absolute to be grasped by the mind. Now, this is the basic thing we must understand. It's not really a matter of whether a man believes that Jonah is historical or Adam and Eve were real people, but it goes far deeper than that. You see, in the press that in St. Louis, the average person, he reads it, oh, it's just a matter of certain people believe that Jonah was real, other people say it was perhaps a parable or Adam and Eve. But it's far greater than that. Pastor Roth. As president of Evangelical Lutherans in Mission, what is your you, response? <laughs> well, I subscribe to the fact that there is absolute truth, Herman. There's no question about that. I also believe that formulations of that truth need to be changed. The truth does not change, but language changes constantly. And therefore, in order to apply that eternal truth to the current situation, you must change your formulations of that. Otherwise, if you stand pat on the same kind of statements, while the world changes, you are changing too. Reverend Baker, you're still a graduate student. Yes, sir. What, what's the issue, concretely? I would agree with Pastor Otten that it is just much more 
than Jonah, the historicity of Adam and Eve, and other particular passages in the scriptures. But I would say also that it's the synodical stance, not so much that these things are historical just because the scriptures say they are, but because of their crucial relation to the doctrines of our church, namely Christology or uh, the end times, eschatology, etc., the last days, for instance, the judgment day. And I think what the problem is, Pastor Roth, is that there is a dissension within our church of those who wish to change certain absolute truths to become more palatable, or however you would want to say it, for our day, that the synodical position feels is not either valid or scriptural. You mean behind the desire on our part uh, to formulate doctrine in a way that fits the situation, there is an unwillingness to accept the truth of God? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I think I would uh, say this. There is, um, it's possible that this has come about because of a change in the definition of the truth of God, but there are some uh, specific instances that we could uh, bring up, I think, that would make it clear as to what we mean by changing the truth of God in order to uh, help the modern man or the contemporary man understand the biblical message. As you see it, Tom, you're saying that on the one hand, there are people who want to accept the truth as God gives it to us. On the other hand, there are people who don't. You'd put us in the second group. I would say that on uh, the one hand, there is certain scriptural teachings that um, just by the scriptures themselves make it clear that such and such a thing happened and that there are those within the Synod who cast doubts or raise questions in that area because of this, as Pastor Otten was speaking of, this new way of thinking. Why, no, the que but the question is, why do they do it? Why would anyone question, for example, a traditional interpretation of Genesis 1? Or why would anyone want to question the traditional interpretation of Jonah? Because he doesn't want to accept the Word of God? Is that what you're saying? No, I think it's because he has some prior assumptions and presuppositions concerning God's Word that in times before uh, were never allowed or permitted in the church. Such as? That the uh, Bible is able to contain errors, for instance. Uh, errors of a quality that in times before were not thought to be errors. Um, I could name a, a number of things. Uh, maybe you'd like to say something <coughs> at this point. But. Well, I think we've dropped some pretty heavy terminology already uh, in the beginning of our discussion. Uh, we're talking about truth. I heard you use the word historic, historicity, mm -hmm. and now the word inerrant. And I think we have to come clean on our terminology before we pursue our discussion any further. If uh, by truth you mean that uh, God does not lie, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that God is a liar. If you mean by truth that we can rely upon the scriptures for leading us into faith in Jesus Christ and directing us in our Christian life, then I agree with you. If you mean that uh, truth is to be understood as historic and chronological accuracy in every minute detail, then I think the burden of proof rests upon you to prove that. Because as I read the scriptures, I see some apparent contradictions in history and chronology and um, I think that if you are going to define the word truth in terms of that kind of inerrancy, then uh, you need to make your case. I think the discussion may be furthered along with some specific examples. If I could maybe ask a couple of questions. Um, Pastor Roth, would you believe in the historicity of Adam and Eve as stated in the clear passages of Genesis 1 and 2? Yes. Would you? Do you believe that the faculty majority at the Concordia Seminary also believe that the historicity of Adam and Eve as stated in Genesis 1 and 2 is true? That's my understanding, yes. Would you say, for instance, that a student who is to be certified for the ministry, that if he denies this historicity, that there should be some question raised as to whether or not he should be certified? Well, again, you're talking about a definition. You have to explain what you mean by historicity. Mm -hmm. Let me be clear okay. and what I said. Right. You asked, did I believe in the historicity of Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. My answer is yes. I do not believe that Genesis 1 necessarily has to be read as literal history, however. 
I think God can give us his truth in many forms, and there is a valid difference of opinion as to whether Genesis ought to be interpreted in a completely literal fashion or if it ought to be interpreted in a, in a figurative fashion. I think both possibilities are there, and I think both men who take those positions can approach the scriptures as the authoritative word of God. That's what I was getting at before when I asked you, when you see people approaching scripture and coming up with non-traditional uh, interpretations, mm -hmm. you assume, I, I guess, that they don't believe that God can speak eternal truth, that they don't believe that God doesn't lie, they don't believe in miracles and this sort of thing. I think that's a wrong assumption. Yeah, I would agree, and I don't think that's what I believe. I honestly believe that the uh, faculty majority and those uh, persons you know, on the uh, dissenter side do believe that God... Accept the uh, narrative in Genesis 1 as, as literal. Yes. Do you accept the fact that there could be figurative terminology there, that there are some things which could be interpreted symbolically? Uh, can you give an example of what you're thinking of? Yes, for example, uh, when it says God walks in the garden, can that be understood fi figuratively or must it be understood literally? It is a uh, figurative, I would. So because there, of the there, scripture interprets scripture principle. There, is a, there, there are figures, there are symbols in it, in the uh, uh, original because, Genesis account. Oh, agreed. Because with our principle of scripture interprets scripture, it's clear that God at that point didn't have legs. So to say that he walked in the, water, uh, in the garden uh, by the very principle of scripture interprets scripture, we can say emphatically that no, you, you wouldn't find his footprints or this sort of thing, because it's clear from the scriptures that at this point he was a spirit. I guess the question I would ask is, do you believe that uh, uh, Satan appeared in the guise of a serpent to Adam and Eve? I think it's entirely possible that that too is symbolical. I see. Well, this is, I think, uh, where I would ask the question then, where in the entire scriptures, using the principle of scripture, interpret scripture, do we have any indication that these passages in Genesis 1 and 2 uh, and other passages we could mention could uh, be taken metaphorically or symbolically? The, the question, Tom, is, when you study the Genesis account as a student of scripture, is there anything which insists that you must take it literally and cannot take it figuratively? That's the question. You already have said there is a figurative expression there. Could that not be true of other things in the Genesis account also? If scripture interprets scripture, along that principle, if those things are found to be, then this, of course, could be then a figurative uh, kind of interpretation. I, I'm just a little concerned with the principle that uh, just because, you know, it's there, there's no reason why we must take it um, literal. Uh, moving over into the resurrection, is there any reason why we must say, using the principle you used, that the tomb of Jesus Christ is empty? Is it not possible? Could this not be an open question? As a student of scripture, do you see the difference between the gospel narrative accounts and the account of Genesis? As a student of scripture, don't you see the complete difference in the kind of literature that we're dealing with in the opening chapters of Genesis as compared to the uh, gospel narrative of Mark, for example? Every a uh, student of scripture recognizes the difference between those two accounts. The well, this is, all right, that's interesting. Now, John the Baptist, for instance, uh, maybe Jerry could help us here now. Would you insist that a student, to be certified, uh, agree with the literal understanding of Mark 1, that John the Baptist was in a wilderness, that he ate locusts, that he wore camel's hair, or is there the possibility, under the freedom of the gospel, with the historical critical method being used, that this could be a theological uh, wilderness, that it was only for the point, the gospel point, of seeing John the Baptist as the forerunner of Jesus, the second Elijah, and that therefore a, a student who questioned the actual being in the wilderness of John the Baptist, this would, could be an open question. Tom, your question is a very long one. I'd like to answer it uh, briefly, if I could. Um, our own synodical handbook and uh, our own confessions 
tell us what uh, we need to confess in order to be ministers of Jesus Christ. And that is namely to confess the Old and New Testaments as the inspired Word of God and the uh, confessions as a true exposition of the Word of God. That's how I would answer your question whether or not a person could be certified if uh, he held such and such a position. Well, I guess I'm wondering, uh, uh, I've heard many people who say they hold to the confessions and the scriptures but don't believe in the biological virgin birth of Jesus Christ. They consider this to be an open question. Now, would that person, to use a specific example, could that person be certified even though he says he, he holds to the confessions, he makes this statement? First of all, I don't know who you're talking about. I know of no student on the campus of Concordia Seminary and I know of no faculty person on the campus of Concordia Seminary who denies the virgin birth. And I see that implied in your question, and so I'll throw it back to you. And I'd say, if you know of someone like that, speak to him yourself first. Well, I'm, I guess from my point of view, I'm just trying to wonder if it's worth speaking or whether this particular um, question of whether or not the virgin birth really was biological, if this is you know, worth all the time and trouble of arguing or stopping someone from being certified, for instance, if he you know, doesn't allow this. Can I interrupt just a second, Tom? When you talk about certification, you're talking about authority. And President Price has said the question in our Senate is one of authority at the moment. Certification implies authority. Mm -hmm. From your standpoint, Herman and Tom both, where does the authority lie in the church? May we wait for the answer, please? And may I say to each of you that whether you belong to a church, have ever belonged to a church, you live in what the world calls Christendom. We hope you find this a fascinating, interesting discussion, and we're just beginning. We'll be right back. fortress. Pastor Roth, do you mind restating your question uh, to Reverend Baker? The question Reverend had to do with authority. Uh, President Price has said we have a crisis of authority. I think that's right. And my question is, how do you men see it? Where does the authority lie? Right. I would, Tom, Go ahead. I would say the ultimate authority in our church still is scripture. And for that reason, the position held by Mr. Miller and a good majority of the faculty at the seminary is contrary to scripture. And for that reason, I maintain they have no right remaining in our church as professors as long as they do not affirm, for instance, the historicity of Adam and Eve. Now, I know we can talk about in all sorts of fancy language here about we affirm the historicity or we don't affirm. The fact of the matter remains these men do not affirm the historicity of Adam and Eve as that is commonly understood. Today we have a, actually an untruthful use of language in our church. Our professors will say, we believe in the historicity of Adam and Eve. And then you start questioning them. What do you mean by history? Do you mean it's a, an event that occurred like George Washington in 1776 crossing the Delaware River? Well, now it's a little different than that, you see. It happened in a different realm, perhaps the realm of Geschichte. Or, you know, they make that distinction between the two realms of history. We are asking, did this actually happen? Was there an original man and an original woman in the Garden of Eden? Did they fall into sin? And the position of our faculty is that you do not have to believe that. Here we have the report of the synodical president. This is an, a report that was made of uh, transcriptions and the like of these professors. And here one of the professors was asked this very question in his own words. First the committee asks, so you say, so you are saying that out of the mass of ape-like creatures running around, God picked two and called them Adam and Eve, and then it takes off from there. And then the professor responds, this is right. He chose a segment of that earlier creation and made it into the human race, right. Now, all the professors may not maintain that position, but not, that nevertheless 
is a position which is held by them to be permissible in our church. There are others. Herman, uh, can I interrupt you for just a second? You said that the authority was the word of God, right. and you took off from there. Right. Now, we all agree with that. Is it possible that honest men of God, honest students of Scripture, can come to the Scripture as authoritative and come away with differing opinions about that and still affirm the authority of the Word of God? My question is, when they do, for example, when a man comes to Genesis and he takes the position that you do, that there is no other possible interpretation than the absolute literal interpretation, Another well, man, equally absolute literal. That, that's like they like to smear us with that, you know, that we believe that God had legs and so on. No, we, as Tom said, we believe Scripture interprets Scripture. But what Scripture intends to be taken literally, that we must t take literally. Obviously, if we take literal interpretation of Scripture, then we have to believe that, well, Herod was like a little bushy fox, fox you see, running with a tail around because, uh, you know, we call him, he was called like Herod, see. Uh, no, we accept the natural, historical interpretation of Scripture. Wait a As minute, wait a minute now, Herman. When you say natural, historical, you'll have to explain that to me. Because by nature, my nature says there can't be anything supernatural, there can't be anything miraculous. If you're going to say natural historical, doesn't that mean that you'd have to rule out the miraculous? No, I would say perhaps maybe the ordinary, the way the ordinary person reads this. But say. what is ordinary for one person may not be ordinary for another. I think a man who has dedicated his life to the study of the Old Testament and who bows to the authority of the Word of God may just come up with a different interpretation from what you are doing. Now, when he does, how do we deal with this man? All right, first do we say, if it's not traditional, you must go away? Or do we study together the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit work that unity which he has promised to do? That, for me, is the problem. All right. Now, you heard this quotation which I read. The organization you represent, I understand, is trying to, uh, well, you're calling for the resignation of President Price, right? We okay. have suggested right. that that's now, a very good right, possibility, now, right. yes. Now, you heard this statement. Do you believe that a professor in our church ought to be permitted to continue teaching in our seminary who believes this about Adam and Eve, that we have come up from some ape-like creatures? Would you defend this man's position? I would ask him, first of all, why he accepts that kind of a position. What you're talking about is not what b the Bible teaches. You're talking about a scientific explanation of how the world was created. My position is, that the Bible does not tell us that. The Bible affirms that God indeed did create the world out of nothing, that he created man and woman as special beings, his representatives on earth, that these people fell into sin, and that God has made it possible for them to be reconciled to him through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the message of Scripture. Hmm. Now, I think that there are valid differences of opinion as to how that message gets through to us in Genesis. And if a man differs on the how of creation, I think that there are some valid possibilities, yes. That's a question for science. The Bible doesn't speak to that. The Bible doesn't talk about the how of creation. In other words, it's, it should be allowable in our church then to maintain that man has progressed from some primary organism. That's the position of Elam. If, that this, it should be an allowable position. I'm, I'm not, not asking for, for what you believe, but what will you allow to be taught in our so church? Who by who do you mean who should allow it? Well, this what is what I mean. What I'm saying, there you come again with allowing. Mm. Who is, what is the authority? Only that should be allowed in the church which the Word of God teaches. That's what right. ought to be allowed. Okay. I'd like to say a few words if I could. It's a little hard to get in here. And so this takes us back a couple of minutes before. Reverend Otten, you accused me. Uh, you said, Mr. Miller denies the historicity of Adam and Eve. I find that very strange because uh, I shook hands with you for the first time in the dressing room mm -hmm. just five minutes ago, and we did not talk theology. How do you know what I believe? Well, on the basis of the conversation which being, is being held here, and you are also defending the theological position of the faculty majority, correct? I am trying to put the best construction on everything. Are you defending the theological mm -hmm. position of the faculty majority? I'll repeat, I'm trying to put the best construction on everything. If you have a question about a man's theology, see him yourself. Ask him what he meant. You were putting words into my mouth before, never asking me what I believed. I think that's the issue at stake. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with people who have written things which we do not understand or agree with? Now, Mr. Miller, 
<clears throat> True, this is the first time we have met. I have read, though, many things that you have written. Uh, you are the president of the student body, but correct? There have been too many because I haven't written that much. Well, you, we've published a good number of them in our paper. Some of the letters you've written, we've had a number of pictures in there. And you're always in the forefront defending the faculty majority. Now, Pastor Roth has the actual statement there in which the faculty leaves this an open question. And let me assure you that I have talked to these men hundreds of hours. Already 10 and 15 years, well, it would be 15 years now, where these men did deny the historicity of Adam and Eve. We had them in a court case, so to speak. Actually, they took us to court. And, was, and uh, then these men would come in there, and, and they would have they put their hand on the Bible. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And then they had, the faculty had attorneys. I didn't have any attorney there. And then they would question these men. And they would ask them, do you believe in the historicity of Adam and Eve? And the professor would say, absolutely, we believe in the historicity of Adam and Eve. And the common, ordinary layman there, who was sort of the jury, mm -hmm. you see, the Board of Appeals, they would say, well, Otten's all wrong. He lied. Well, that's a matter of biblical interpretation. The quotations here, you know that some of your professors leave that an open question, right? Walking on the water, isn't that correct? They leave that an open issue. A yes or no answer now. I've never sat in front of a professor who would even talked about the possibility of that being an open question. Have you read the blue book? Have no, you? I haven't read that whole blue book. You haven't read this book? Mm. That's right. I have sat in front of the teachers at the seminary for three years now, and it is on the basis of that experience that I judge them and a on the basis of that experience, I'm here tonight to say to you that I think you ought to be careful before you say they're guilty of teaching false doctrine. Herman, I I'd like to break in just a second, and you said that we're dealing with a problem of truth right. in the St. Louis area. Absolutely. You've been publishing for some, how many years now? Eleven. And I think that's right. I'd, I'd like to read something from an article which appeared in Christian News in August of 1973 about John Teachin because he's been a, one of your prime targets. Right. And I'd like to, to put this in the light of truth. This is a description of John Teachin. Those who remember his election and induction into office in 1969 remember the messianic joy and saintly splendor which surrounded these occasions. St. Louis professors and students gushed over in praise for their new leader. Several lavish enthronement activities were planned. Banquets, receptions, inductions, and communion services of victory were lavished on the liberal hero. Now, a communion service, the highest act of worship that we have in our church, which is dedicated to the praise and honor of Jesus Christ, you're saying that was lavished on the liberal hero. No kinder words could have been found for the gods. Tejan was to be canonized while living. Tejan was most, more vociferously liberal than any of his friends thought he would be. He talked a tougher game than Fearbringer ever did. The polished Lacusa PR man had been brought up in a tough section of New York City, and he knew the science of intrigue and survival. In the style of a New York City gang leader, he would work to get the complete loyalty of the mob. The cool PR man was at heart a ruthless leader who tolerated no insubordination from his underlings. The polish was to be reserved for those who were still not dominated by him. In his quiver were countless honorary DDs to be freely spent to buy support, to buy support from reluctant district, college, and seminary presidents. Next thing he had to do was to move the board of control in line. Some were bribed, there the word is used, by the Doctor of Divinity degrees. The price was reasonable. Tejan was committed to filling the liberal St. Louis faculty with more liberals. His famous temper tantrums would never really let him be an effective administrator. The liberals did not know this before his election. Since he was never the type of church leader who listened to the opinions of others, he was more of a dictator than a leader among equals. Some compared him to Hitler. He bucked no opposition from anyone, including the faculty, the Board of Control, and the President of Synod. His almost uncontrollable outbursts of anger reminded many of a pampered child who was not getting his way. He showed no appreciation for the opinions of others. The only ones who would control him were his faculty assistants. While the liberals well, made sure that all the, Just, just uh, one, one more be, sentence, okay, and then ahead. I want to ask Herman a question. While the liberals made sure that all the Synod heard Price's dictum that Teachin must go, the liberals made sure that no one heard of Teachin's remark, 
There is not enough room for me in that and that SOB in the same church. Now, Herman, did you write this? Well, I have to say that we had one of our editorial writers write that. Who wrote it? Would you tell us? I don't care to reveal my source. We've point. had so many anonymous uh, pieces yeah, yeah. floating around in the church, one of them being a letter which maybe uh, Jerry could comment on in a few minutes. But I'd like to know who wrote that, because this is the symptom of the sickness that grips our church now. It is this kind of thing that made New Orleans possible, because when people came, they were conditioned not to believe the men that they were listening to. Mm. Pastor Roth, may I ask Pastor Otten, as editor of Christian News, if you accept that editorial and endorse it. Right, I would say that I checked up on some of the things. In fact, I even wrote to Dr. Tejan about that last quotation that you said. I asked him whether he really said that. Of course, he didn't respond, and this has been the problem. But uh, right. I would say this is our paper. It's unsigned, so therefore I'm responsible, correct. I'm not going to shirk responsibility on this, but obviously anybody knows that no pastor is going to be able to write everything that we have in our paper. We have editorial writers, and at times I just don't care to say who's running. It's our staff, you see. Or uh, Excuse uh, me, the question is, is that truth? What's that? The question is, is that truth? Well, I, the reason, again, I don't know all the details you know, what it's being referred to there. This person obviously knows Dr. Teachin a little better than I do, although I do know Dr. Teachin. I already, uh, well, we went to school together. As Boston. you know him, Herman, does this describe John Teachin? Yes, to a large extent, as I have gotten to, to uh, observe him in more recent years, not the way I knew him, say, 15 years ago, although at that time we did have a rather, uh, uh, well, heated discussion on whether Christ is the only way to heaven. And Dr. Tejan defends the position of some of those others in our church, which I would say is universalism, which maintains that we can't say that Christ is the only way. Dr. Tejan said, well, see, at that time I think he was going to Union Seminary, getting his Ph.D. there, and his point was that we can't say that those who die necessarily without a saving faith in Christ are lost in hell. And I said, well, Christ is the only way to heaven. I said, I don't like the fact that these people are lost, but uh, uh, he defended that position. As a churchman and as a Christian, Herman, Mm. Don't you see your responsibility as to what you send out to the church and the kind of way you picture people? Right, right. And you believe that this is a proper way to bring about some well, kind of understanding uh, Lee, and reconciliation? Let me um, I suppose for every item that Sam Roth wants evidence for, I could pick up Missouri in perspective here. And I mean, I just gone through a number of issues here, six issues, and as I go through them, I had red lines all the way through it. I don't know if we're really here today to discuss, you know, the merits of who's telling the truth or who's not telling the truth. I'd like to try and get back to the actual issue. Uh, Reverend Baker, may I really say, though, that I think it would be important if you have a quotation, an article oh, sure. from Missourian perspective that has the same tenor, the same tone, the same quality of writing and point of view. Uh, from an opposing position? Well, I think what we're speaking of is not so much the... Uh, what we're speaking, he's speaking of, is the misrepresentation that's going on. And this is the discussion... I who, who is speaking of misrepresentation? Pastor Roth. In I'm, his speaking, discussion I'm of speaking about slander. I'm speaking about untruthful slander. Right. Well, I think... For every item that you think is slander, we could, uh, there's been some uh, churchmen, I don't have any of their letters here, but the forum, for instance, has um, discussed or spoken of President Price's Caiaphas. Um, uh, have, have, have you something there that, that corresponds? Well, uh, what I was uh, trying to get at was this issue of misrepresentation. Uh, there's a, a chart here that... Uh, uh, on Missouri in perspective, the December 24th issue. And uh, I think I'd like to bring this one up. Number one, it doesn't deal with personalities, but number two, it deals with the issues. And I think it misrepresents them. Uh, it is a discussion of what we, the synodical position and the dissenters, supposedly agree on. Um, that the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the inspired written word of God and the only source and standard for what we believe and proclaim. That term inspired, first of all, is used in a different definition by the synodical stance over and against the Elamite stance. I don't believe that either side would agree on their definition of what we mean by the only source of Scripture. Um, total, complete, and unswerving agreement on virtually all the truths of Christendom. 
holy baptism, the Lord's Supper, prayer, predestination, the continuing and creation of God, the deity and humanity of Christ. There are many differences that we have in these various areas. And I was just trying to say here that what we need to do at this point is try to get a little more understanding between us as to where, really where we should agree to disagree. But we're talking about human beings, Tom. Yeah. May we come back to this, Pastor Roth? It is time for a break, and we'll resume and be right back with us, will you please? Let's <coughs> go. Conflict in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Theology or politics. Pastor Roth, I interrupted you. When we talk about conflict and when we talk about the church, what we're talking about is people talking to one another. And I think that the, that's what the church is all about, how we deal with one another. I see uh, the big problem here, one of the big problems, we have learn not to trust each other. You talked about uh, people not being truthful in language, and I understand that because I begin to suspect people, too, when I don't trust them. I think it's obvious that you suspect me of false teaching, and therefore you mistrust my words. Now, what leads to that mistrust? I think what leads to it is how they are characterized in the minds of other people. Christian News and uh, Watershed at Rivergate conditioned people to look at other human beings a certain way. I think it's terribly important what we say about those individuals so that we don't destroy the trust that we have in one another. I feel the same way about uh, soliciting unsigned material or, or uh, uh, distributing unsigned material in the church on the part of the officials. President Preuss this past week sent out a letter which I think was just about as scandalous as what I read before. It was an unsigned piece. No one knows how many people wrote it. But most and of the Missouri in perspective, you know, is unsigned. All the articles in there, I don't... In fact, now they've even taken off who the editors are. Tom, there is nothing scandalous about people in there. At least I pray to God there is not. I'm talking about people who are attacking other people and destroying their credibility because we destroy our trust. If we do not have trust in one another in the church, there can be no reconciliation because there is no ground to talk. Do you like mean you don't me. trust those students who sent out that letter? I don't know who they are. If you will show me who they are... Dr. Shalman has said that any group that uh, would like to see the names and our official groups may be glad to, maybe you know, are invited to see the names of those students. I think the point no, is... No, he didn't say that. He said he would give them only to the Board of Control. Jerry, have you found out who they are? I certainly haven't, and uh, Tom, if you're telling me that Pastor Roth can get those names, I'd be more than happy to have him do that in the next couple of days. Well, I think the reason that, uh, one, one reason they, uh, they were afraid to sign is simply because they are very afraid of uh, what will happen to them when they do sign this thing and make their names public. Afraid of what? Afraid uh, of what will happen to them. They won't get a call into the ministry. Right. I can speak from personal experience, Pastor Roth. That's what happens. Now, I think we could argue a long time sure, on, on this. Uh, this, you know, this side slanders that side, and right. I think many of the, in our audience, they don't even know the names of these people. But I think it's of utmost importance that we establish whether there really is a theological That's difference right. between the two groups. That's the important thing. You know, whether uh, this man, uh, whether it was $20,000 or $200,000, all these are peripheral things. So, you know, whether a deal was made or wasn't made, that's all being said in the papers today. Now, the reason we oppose the theology taught the seminary because we think it's contrary to scripture. Right. Now, we contend, President Preuss contends, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And if a person dies without a saving faith in Christ, if he doesn't place his hope in the merits of the blood-bought forgiveness of Jesus, he is lost in hell. Now, Pastor Roth, do you think there is room in our church for men who say that Christ is not the only way and that maybe some of these people who die without Christ are going to be saved and get to heaven. I think there is no way to salvation except through Jesus Christ. But that's I think not my question. Is, I my think qu there is no room in the church for anybody who would deny that Christ is the only way to heaven. But my starting point when I talk about salvation is the grace of God, Herman. I think you and I and every person who will ever be saved in the world is saved by the grace of God. Now, God has given us certain means to use 
to bring his grace to people. That's the word of God and the sacraments. Those are the only things I have. I think it's perfectly possible for God to save anybody he pleases in his grace in the way that he wants to. That's the way we've always believed, and that's the way I believe today. That's one of the problems I have with President Price's statement, the first article in that statement, where he seems to exclude anybody who has never heard of Jesus Christ from salvation. We have never taught well, that. Well, what did Jesus say? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The Athanasian Creed makes it quite clear, in fact, perhaps even clearer than President Price makes it. He, it says, I'm sure you recall the words, whosoever shall be saved, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. And the Catholic faith is this, and then it goes on. You've got to believe in the Trinity. And then it concludes with that statement, unless you believe this, you are lost in hell. That's the Athanasian Creed. And how does one get that faith? Well, of course, this is a gift from the, the God. God. God how does God it give it to us? Through word and sacrament. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, still, I don't see the point here. God gives I, us That's the, the whole point. It is the gift of God to right. every person. He uses word and sacrament. He binds us to that. Is it possible, Herman, for God to save someone who has never heard a word of the Bible? Is it possible? Oh, absolutely. Uh, sure, God can. Is it God. possible for God to save someone who has never heard of Jesus Christ? But God says. Is it possible? Jesus well, of course, all things are possible, but the fact remains, God says in his word that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Right, now, and here's that's what the view I live which by, and I preach by. Now, here the seminary is talking about universalism. This is an article taken from the seminarian. That this ism is on campus, and perhaps is in all of us, is a presupposition of this article. And the student goes on to say that there is this idea that people are saved without Christ on campus. But he knows that he concludes by making this statement. Much of this plethora of doubt goes unchecked, for our attitude toward the written word has changed. We are not talking about the shattering of mechanistic views of inspiration, but have not turned seminary studies for some turn the word into a mixture of sundry sources, rendering dubious the point where God's word begins and man's leaves off. Our parents, home pastors, and probably the consensus of synod's clergy hold to a different viewpoint on eternal damnation than many of us. Since they are the present establishment, we had better, for sundry reasons, keep quiet. Uh, then he concludes, but who dares present for correction more new seminary ideas to an already skeptical synod? Now, of course, we photographed the whole article, put it in our paper, and some might say, well, just one student opinion, but this article was defended by the faculty. And this is the reason I oppose John Teach. And I have to admit, I didn't write that article, but I'll take responsibility for it. That English is far beyond my capacity anyway. I like to speak I, in, I certainly hope so. I, I, I like to speak in simple, plain terms. The reason we have opposed President Teach from the very time that he was asked or, or invited to be the president when they elected him, even before he had accepted it, was because he's a theological liberal. I know this from personal experience. He told us that a man who, for instance, believes that Jesus Christ did not rise physically from the dead can still be considered a good Christian. Dr. Tejan does not affirm the historicity of Jonah. He allows for the possibility that the books of the first five books of the Bible were not written by Moses, but that they came from a vast conglomerate known as J-E-D and P. Is now, that doctrine? This is, is that doctrine? The history of Jonah? Well, certainly is. Sure is. is now, uh, would you say then that in our church... JDP, is that doctrine or is that theological theory? Well, it's a teaching of the Bible. Our Lord... JEDP is a teaching of the Bible? JEDP. Well, I think perhaps, Mr. Parker, we should explain what we mean by mm -hmm. JEDP. You see, the Bible and our Lord Jesus Christ teaches that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. I mean, uh, Moses, for instance. That's I mean, your interpretation. Is that so our Lord stated in the Bible? Right, right. That Here, is, for instance, that is your interpretation. Uh, of what Jesus our Lord talking has in, said. in John chapter five. He says, uh, uh, "You don't believe in me because you don't believe in Moses, and Moses he wrote of me." And there are many passages in the Old Testament where it says, "And Moses wrote," and these are the words of Moses. Don't you allow you for the possibility of that referring to the corpus of writings? You don't. You don't think there's any possibility that when our Lord uses the term Moses, he's not referring to the author of all the books, but he's referring to that corpus of literature. Isn't that a, at least a possibility, Herman? There's Wouldn't you at least allow things. for that? Right, now, some things in the Pentateuch which were not written by Moses, correct? 
But he's referring to specifically those verses which Christ himself attributes to Moses, which right, but you're already allowing, you're already allowing no. for the possibility of multiple right. authors. No, I think in the, the synodical point is not that Moses wrote the entire Pentateuch, but that those, especially those portions which Jesus ascribes to Moses, were written by Moses. For, you know, Jesus in John 5, he says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Now, Mr. Miller, if you accept the JEDP sort hypothesis, am I correct to understand that this is the position of your faculty, that they teach this? They, they teach it. it as a source hypothesis. Well, That's right. Right. The they, difference is, is a theory. It's uh, not taught as doctrine. Uh, when I was introduced, for instance, to the historical critical method, I had Prost, Kalin, and Klein. And I'll speak from my own personal experience in uh, Exegesis 100. The first day we came into the classroom, Prost, Kalin, and Klein said to us, we are going to teach you a method of biblical interpretation. It's a method which we find to be very helpful in dealing with the scriptures. You may not agree with us, but we ask you to give it your sincere attention because we believe that it's very helpful in understanding the scriptures. They taught it as a helpful theory. They did not teach it as doctrine. But unless you agree with it, then you weren't a good scholar at that seminary. That is absolutely untrue, and uh, I have the endorsement of a number of students who can prove that that's well, I, absolutely untrue. I guess all we need to do is look at what I'd like to quote uh, Dr. Mr. Teaching Wheatley, if I could, from a letter which was endorsed by 15 students on campus who identify themselves in the following words. We have in common a, quote, conservative approach toward the scriptures and the Lutheran confessions. And they go on to write, quote, at no time were any of us harassed, bullied, or downgraded by our professors because we disagreed with them. Instead, they accepted us in love and dealt pastorally with us, and through their lives, teaching, and confession, they have witnessed their faith to us." End of quote. I don't believe that uh, your point can be made. Right. Okay, let me, well, let, they no, let, me their let me finish names, this. Mr. Yes, Miller. they did sign their names. Now, sign. what is this letter that President Preuss circulated uh, to Which 60, four students to 60,000 people, to 60,000 people in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, President Price sent a letter as documentation for his charges that the faculty has done the things that these students denied, an unsigned letter with, which is obviously not documentary proof. But distributed me. by, though, clearly Dr. Price. He, he took the responsibility for sending it to 60,000 people. Uh, yes, yes, he did. May I say something here? As to your first point, that the historical critical methodology is an open question whether you use it or not, and the Blue Book uh, statement from President Teachin, March 6, 1972, statement to the seminary community, it is not possible for a seminary professor to teach courses in biblical interpretation at the seminary level without using historical critical methodology. Yes, but you As were saying a student, that a student, you were saying that a student right. could not use another uh, method without his grade suffering. That's true. I'm and a personal I, example of this. Now, I maybe, disagree with that. All right, let me say, the reason that you aren't of that experience, Jerry, is because you agree with that method, and you can use it. But from personal experience, I was told by two professors that I would not be certified for ordination if I did not allow for the use of the historical critical method as used at the seminary. I was told by one professor six months before I was to be certified that he was not going to vote for me. I was told by the other one ten minutes before certification that he had still doubts. This caused me and 29 other students to write a letter on January 21st, 1971. It was also unsigned for the same fears that this letter that President Price said that was your was last unsigned. year on campus before you right. went to Right, my last Michigan. year on campus. Have you been certified? Yes. Thank you. You were not voted out. No. And I told the professors at that point that when they were telling me this, I, I felt that this was just a threat against me. I didn't believe that they would carry it through because of certain conditions. Okay. But let me say these particular things that we wrote at this time. Most of them already corroborate what the student letter to President Price this last past week went out with. That we too came under these same kinds of, how shall I say it, insistences that we use a historical critical method and that various teachings, and we number a, a, a number of them here, where we had documentation that the existence of angels and demons is doubtful. Many of the miracles and acts did not really occur. Angels may not exist. Homosexuality is not always a sin. The violent revolution may be a way of bringing God's kingdom in. 
The scriptures are inspired only in the same sense as our sermons are inspired. The writers of Genesis 1 to 11 felt the material he was presenting was historically true, but we are not bound by the facticity of these events. I myself four years ago attended chapel services and needed to sit in the, in the balcony because I was unable to pray many of the prayers that were said. And Tom, who's the author of those statements? This is, uh, this is by 30 students. They withheld their names. The names are on file, and the names, I believe, were given to uh, those committees that needed them for New Orleans. But I know personally every one of the 30 students because I took the letter around to ask them to sign it. And every one of them would sign it only in, on condition that their names would not be made known at that time because have of their fear. Have they been certified? Uh, not all of them yet. No. Have, any, have any been refused certification? Not at this point, no. Uh, perhaps I might add here that 15 years ago we were faced with the same problem. Of course, at that time, uh, these things really weren't that much in the public eye. When we first went to the president of the Senate and told him that there were some men who didn't believe in the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch or the historicity of Jonah. The Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible. Moses. You see, the, the position which is defended here by Mr. Miller, or at least allowed, you see, which is the position now held what by... Is J-E-D-P? Well, what J-E-D-P, does it stand for? Right. See, Moses lived around 1500 B.C. And we contend that he wrote these first five books and that they can turn, uh, well, that he actually wrote these things. Well, then they say that Moses didn't write them. They were written by various schools of thought writers and so on. They look known as J, E, D, and P. See, uh, uh, they're just different code names. We could go into a long explanation here. But anyway, they came centuries after Moses lived and died, you but see. But see, J, E, D, and P represent people. Right. Documents. People. Documents, people. Documents, you see. Documents. Right. Written at various stages. Right, right. 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 Now, now, this is their position, and it's our contention that once you deny various parts of Scripture, then you begin uh, ultimately to undermine... How does that deny various parts of Scripture? Well, because the Scriptures say Moses wrote them. It's as simple as that. Jesus quotes the Scriptures and says, as Moses spake. And we don't have any problem with that. Look, why, is that, why is that denying the Scriptures? All right, here, Exodus 24. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Now, how do you get around that? Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. I'm for instance, not trying Deuteronomy, to get around it. Deuteronomy, for instance. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, until they were finished. Now, this is not really the place where we can go into a long no. discussion on this matter of JEDP. But I, think I can the assure you that I have attempted to do this. We have challenged your scholars on the seminary faculty to have a scholarly debate on this point. It's our position that we are taking the scholarly position. You men are taking the old-fashioned position, which is, you know, just taking it from these modern scholars. But do you think that your faculty would dare debate, recognize conservative scholars? No, they are afraid to do this. The same thing with regard to the word alma. Your faculty contends, and it says it right here. Now, that's a Hebrew word for virgin. The men of our faculty are afraid to debate you, Herman Otten, would you? No, I'm not saying we were going to arrange a debate with a leading top scholar, with scholars on your faculty, particularly with regard to the meaning of the word Alma. Now that's the word in Isaiah 714, the word for virgin. Mm -hmm. Now you see, our faculty today at Concordia Seminary, as they've got it in that book that Pastor Roth had there, says that this should not be translated uh, virgin, but it should be translated young woman. And they say that when Isaiah made this prophecy... Young behold, woman or young wife? Uh, young woman uh, or maiden, but it's not virgin. Now, they say that Isaiah, you know, the words go, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now, our faculty today contends, and it's in that book, that Isaiah wasn't at all predicting any uh, miraculous birth uh, 700 years from that point, at least not at first, but he was only referring to the immediate his historical situation, and that it was just a reference to some young woman at that time. Now, we contend on the basis of the best scholarly evidence that that word can only be translated virgin, and that there was only one virgin birth, and that referred to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our seminary faculty, they are taking Jesus Christ out of the Old Testament. Now, Pastor Roth, am I wrong in saying that the seminary faculty translates this word as young woman? Am Pastor, I wrong in saying that? Pastor Otten, Pastor Roth, may we take our break here and come back to this, if you please. Thank you. We'll be right back. Two minutes. You know, 
the subject of the discussion. Pastor Roth, you were challenged with a question. As far as I know, Herman, the answer is yes. You, was not your question, do they allow for this to be the translation? Right. That this is a possibility. Yeah. Here's what they say, for instance, with regard to the virgin birth. These saving deeds... Oh, wait are a minute, are we talking about Isaiah or are we talking about the virgin birth? Both. Isaiah's reference to the virgin birth. You, you're not no, saying, I, however, that if they allow for the translation, young woman in Isaiah, this means that they deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. No, I'm saying they are denying the messianic nature of that particular prophecy. And they are denying what the New Testament says with regard to the translation of that word. Now, here, here's what they say. These saving deeds are bound up with the hardcore events of human history. Notice they say hardcore events of human history. The liberation of Israelite slaves from Egypt, the birth of a carpenter's son in a manger at Bethlehem. Now, is that a hardcore event of history? The birth of a carpenter's son? I would say that birth is a hardcore event. Having witnessed the birth of my own son, yes, I think that's a hardcore event. Yeah, but Jesus was not... Was he not called the son of Joseph ever? Right, but in this sense, to say the hardcore event of history, that's rather confusing terminology. Herman, After all, the real father of our Lord, Sav Savior Jesus Christ, was not Joseph, correct? Is that phraseology the issue, Reverend? Well, all right, Here, here's, here's where they get to Alma. Sol Solomon was the first, this is on page 29, Solomon was the first fulfillment of the messianic promise to David. Similar fulfillments were announced by Isaiah. He spoke of a young woman of his day giving birth to a child. Now, perhaps many people would think, well, that's just a little peripheral issue, whether you call that a young woman or virgin. But you know that there have been tremendous theological debates in the church on this very point. Luther challenged people on this point. You see, the Jews at that time, they were saying, well, that's just a young woman. You see, they couldn't accept the virgin birth. And now we are giving in to them on that point. This is of utmost importance. Now, I know you gentlemen perhaps would say there are no real liberals in our church, correct? I mean, this is the position. How do you define that term? Right? Well, a man who, who, uh, who denies, for instance, the virgin mm -hmm. birth of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, right? You wouldn't... Uh, I don't know of any men in the faculty who deny either. Well, I'm, I'm talking about our church as a whole. Do you know that surveys have shown that in our Lutheran Church, Missouri, and I'm talking about the Jeffrey Hayden survey, that there are over 300 pastors in our church who do not believe the virgin birth, over 300 pastors in our church who do not accept the physical resurrection of Christ. Have you ever over talked 12 to any of them? Pa yes, I have. Mm, I, have I have some too. of their writings here. These men have told me they don't accept the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. No. How have here you are dealt their with writings. Them? How have you dealt with them? I have talked to them. I talked the long question, and hard hours yeah. with them. The question is not one of de dealing at this point. It was just simply a question. Of course, it's an important question. But we're dealing now with what is actually being taught and preached in the pulpits. I agree with that, and I think that that's what we ought to nail down right now. Now, Herman, what you were quoting regarding the interpretation of Isaiah was from right. that portion of uh, the document, mm -hmm. uh, Faithful to Our Calling, where the faculty said these are issues that need to be discussed. However, in the first part, where the affirmations of faith to which they all subscribe this is what they say, and this they subscribe to unconditionally. We affirm that for us and for our salvation, God sent his son to become a human being. For us, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and born in Bethlehem, flesh of our flesh and blood of our blood, yet without sin. For us, he died and was buried. For us, he was raised from the dead on the third day as the first fruits of those who have slept. That is what the faculty confesses right. and confirms. We agree with this. Yes. But the point is, on the one hand, they'll say this. On another hand, they'll say that. That's why it's almost impossible in a short period let's, of time to let's solve take the a, problem here. Yeah. Let's take an issue that maybe is much more clear, uh, the historicity of Jonah. Now, uh, it's certainly an allowable position under the historical critical method that Jonah can be permitted to be denied as actually being in history as explained uh, by the book of Jonah, that it could be a parable or this sort of thing. Now, we conservatives are often, or the synodical position is often accused of a biblicism that we believe in Jonah simply because it's there. But I think this is a really good example to try and indicate that we are concerned with the historicity of Scripture because once one allows for the denial of these particular incidents, then one changes doctrines of the church. And one doctrine, for instance, I'm thinking of is Christology. I guess I'd like just to quote a section from the Scriptures. Uh, from the 11th chapter of St. Luke, where Jesus is speaking to the uh, church 
or to the people of Jerusalem. And they have not listened to him, and they have not come to him, and have been converted by him. But he says to them that they will be in more trouble than the men of Nineveh at the time of Jonah. The uh, passage is Luke 11, uh, verses 29 and following. He uh, explains that the men of Nineveh will be better off in the last day than are the Jerusalemites, because they repented at the teaching of Jonah. Now, my problem with this, and this is where I have great difficulty, I understand that the dissenters are concerned about the gospel relationship of the historicity of the actions in the Old Testament. My concern, though, is that I don't think the issue should be an either-or, either the historicity or the gospel message. I think the synodical position is such that we say the reason that we must insist on the historicity of Jonah is because if we don't insist on it, then we have to change our Christology. Then we have to say that Jesus, when he was speaking to the Jerusalemites, either he was lying, because Jonah never really existed, or he was using the level of their day. Well, what really bothers me about that is that other scholars who have also used the historical critical method to a greater degree come up with the idea that when Jesus in that same passage is speaking of the judgment day and the life after death, that possibly he's also using the level of their day. Now, this, I guess, is the answer, or uh, the question that I would ask you. If you allow for the denial of Jonah, then what assurance is there of what Jesus says in the New Testament? Gentlemen, may I, for our viewers, ask uh, Pastor Baker a question. What happened about Jonah and the whale? What do you think physically, literally, absolutely happened? I think that he was swallowed. Uh, it's interesting that there's uh, not an accurate word there. It doesn't really mean whale, but a large fish. And it even states that God prepared a large fish. Whether he used a creature that was in existence or not, one can't really uh, speak of. But I don't think we should get hung up on whether or not a whale's throat is big enough or this kind of thing. Uh, a recent experience in England where a man was swallowed by a whale and lived to speak of it is an interesting point. But I don't think we even bring this up because we're not attempting to prove what God's word says. We believe God's word said that he was swallowed by a large fish. The point of the Jonah then incident. Then what happened? Well, then I don't he know was, what you believe. Then he was uh, thrown up on the beach, and at this point he still was, you know, kind of terrified to go to the people of Nineveh. The important point of the Jonah incident for me isn't this bit about being swallowed by a large fish, although I do believe this, but that Jesus, or that God, would take a Jew, Jonah, and send him to a Gentile town, Nineveh, and by this one man, through the word, bring conversion to that whole town. This is a wonderful story of great hope and comfort. But then, when we go to the New Testament, and Jesus speaks here on the last day, Jonah and the Ninevites will judge you Jerusalemites. And here I learned at the seminary, you know, it must be an open question. And this is a demand. It must be an open question that Jonah may or may not be historical. It brings me great doubts as to what I say about the rest of the words of Jesus. Comment? Well, you're dealing with the problem of the uh, nature of Jesus Christ. Exactly. And I, I certainly agree with you, Tom, that that's a basic question. The nature of Jesus Christ, the mixture of the divine and the human in him, however, remains a great mystery. It is impossible for us to understand that. I think it is entirely possible to understand the, the parable, the story of Jonah in a, as a parable, and to affirm with absolute faith the d divinity of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew all things. He was omniscient. And yet he said, when he was speaking of the last day, mm -hmm. of that day and that hour knows no one, not even the Son of Man, speaking about himself. Jesus as man a was paradox. not omniscient. In fact, as uh, it's stated by Paul, that he uh, put away his divine divineness and got all his power from God the Father. And at this point, we can't say that he knew all things. It That's, certainly is a different kind of thing to say for him to say, I'm not sure what's going to happen, and on the other hand to say, this is going to happen, and then be wrong. What do Lutherans in the churches in the Missouri Synod, 2,800,000 believe? In what subject? About all, all about the historical critical method, about Jonah, 
the traditional, about the virgin birth, the traditional synodical position, which was reiterated at New Orleans, is the Bible is inherent in everything that it says. It is God's word. Therefore, when Jesus speaks of the history of the Old Testament, when geography is spoken of, um, any of these things, that this is absolute truth. This is true. On the other hand, I would say that the dissenters within the Synod, and you can correct me here, have a, as Pastor Otten started with, have a different view of truth. And they believe that God could even work through what we would consider to be error. For instance, say Moses really didn't write the Old Testament, those sections. But that the point of what was being made in the New Testament is more important than the historical basis as to whether the thing really occurred or not. Do, do any of you have any solid information about what the great body of Lutheran worshipers in the Synod believe? Well, I mean, which way they lean? Right, I think you, as far as this matter of Jonah and Adam and Eve, our synod does speak in convention, and our synod again and again in recent mm -hmm. years has reaffirmed our position. Now, obviously, we haven't taken a poll of the 2.8 million That's what I people, to know. but, of course, various surveys have been taken. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, there's the one, My Generations, and, of course, the startling thing of, in this particular book is that the vast majority of our people still believe that they are saved by what they do. In other words, their God is what they make him. And this is what I think the common man today in America, regardless of which denomination he's affiliated, believes. That it's what a man does that will save him. Yes. Now, what, may I ask, does the common man uh, have to say about John's statement that God is love and Jesus' statement, judge not that ye be not judged, in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, for example? as well as outside it. I think he would say of those things, they are the way I want to live. God is love, and he has proved that in a perfect way in the sending of his own son who died for us. That is the way we ought to live for one another. We ought to serve one another to the yeah. death. I don't see that happening in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod today, and I think the common man is upset because he sees people like us fighting with one another. That is what upsets him. But that him. was also... And the judgment, the statement about judge not that ye be well, not judged. Well, let me answer that, is that um, we interpret that passage to be speaking of judging whether a person is going to be saved or not. We certainly have every confidence from Scripture that we have the ability as well as the responsibility to judge what is yeah, false yeah. teaching, what is not false teaching. Is that determined by the majority vote of a convention? No, this is determined again by Scripture. You bet it is. And, and it's determined this is by why good men of God sitting down together and studying that word this is and why letting the Holy Spirit lead them to this the This is truth. why, again, the statement mm -hmm. at uh, New Orleans was passed, because the statement was sat down with and studied by many, many people. 300,000 people in our synod have signed the statement. The delegates were well informed about the statement, and they believe that the statement is... God's word does, does, does what Jesus said, judge not that ye be not judged, apply to this conflict and the disagreements which you have expressed here today, which are going on between President Price and uh, President Teachin, uh, and so on. Uh, do, they, do they have some meaning to those? And we have about three or four seconds for that answer. Jesus says, don't judge a man's faith, mm -hmm. but we do judge his teaching and what That's he right. writes and what he speaks publicly. I'd like to comment agree? that one from the back door. I think it has something to say to this controversy in this respect. Okay, we'd better stop and save it for the summary. Otherwise, we won't have time for you to wrap it up. Thank you. We'll be back. Summary, Pastor Otten. Well, I think it's obvious that we do have a serious church, we have a serious theological difference. We don't, don't disagree on uh, the interpretation of Jonah in Genesis, but it goes far greater than that. The immortality of the soul is involved in other basic doctrines of the faith. But again, we can't solve all these problems in a short television interview. It's, it takes long and hard hours to deal with this problem, and we hope and pray that it will be solved. We thank you for talking about them. Before we left, you asked whether Judge Knott had something to say to the controversy. I think it does in this respect. We began our program with Martin Luther. I'd like to end with it. Martin Luther said that we should defend our neighbor. We should put the best construction on everything. When I honestly cannot do that any longer, then I need to talk to him, according to Matthew 18, face to face, and to bring that problem up with him, not to splatter his name throughout synod 
and make of him a blocking, a laughing stock before all mankind. Thank you, Mr. Miller and Pastor Walker. Baker. Pastor Baker. I would thank Camel X for the opportunity. Uh, certainly, I think this has brought out into the open a little more that there are some real theological differences, that they're just not some political uh, ramifications. I, am, I wish we had more time. I was astonished um, to hear Jerry speak of uh, his support of the faculty majority without reading the blue book yet, and I would certainly hope that the students possibly would be able to really get into a little more understanding in that area. Thank you, Pastor Baker and Pastor Roth. Yes, truth is not determined by people voting in a convention and a majority determining what the truth is. Truth is determined as good men of God sit down together and study God's word. That's what we want to do. Thank you each and all for this very instructive and very important discussion. Next week.